Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I welcome you to our webinar, Effective Pathways for Africa's Agricultural Transformation. I am Michael Saltz with AgriLinks. Before we begin, let me orient you to the BlueJeans platform. On the right side of the screen, you'll see most of your controls. First, please use the chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world. To ask questions, please use the Q&A button in the bottom right. Please indicate who your question is for. Feel free to upvote questions you want to be answered. You can ask questions throughout the webinar and our Q&A session will be at the end of the webinar. If the presentation is too small on your screen, you can use the slide bar at the bottom of the window to adjust the view. Lastly, you're recording this webinar and we'll email you the post-event resources as soon as they are available. You can also find the resources at agrilinks.org when they are ready. Thank you for your attention. I will now pass it to USAID's Carol Jenkins. Hello everyone. I'm the Office Director for the Center for Agriculture-Led Growth and USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security in Washington. I've uh, been very privileged to work as a USAID Foreign Service Officer for 20 years and the majority of my career has been spent in the field in Feed the Future target aligned countries in both Africa and Asia. I'm very happy to see so many attendees here uh, interested in engaging in the dialogue around agriculture transformation. Agriculture transformation can be a major contributor to improved food security, poverty reduction, and improved access to safe and nutritious foods on the African continent. The agriculture sector employs over 65% of Africa's labor force while supporting the livelihoods of 90% of the population. Um, evidence shows us that growth in the agriculture sector is up to four times more effective at reducing poverty than growth in other sectors of the economy. And this is especially true in lower income countries. Um, in order for agriculture to lead, it is to lead to uh, improvements in food security and incomes, it is imperative that investments are made to transform agriculture into a profitable and sustainable enterprise. The urgency of this transformation has been made clear during the COVID-19 pandemic as the African continent has been forced to rethink its food production and distribution set, uh, systems. This webinar provides the forum to discuss the importance of agriculture transformation in Africa, and I'm very pleased to introduce our speakers um, today who will discuss the topic. Um, our uh, providing opening remarks will be Dr. Kalabata. She is the president of the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, AGRA, where she leads the organization's efforts to ensure a food secure and prosperous Africa. Prior to joining AGRA, Dr. Kalabata served as Rwanda's Minister for Agri of Agriculture and Animal Resources from 2008 to 2014. Dr. Kalabata has a distinguished track record in Africa and globally as an agriculture scientist, policymaker, and thought leader. In December of 2019, she was appointed as a UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for the UN Food System Summit to be held this September. I'm also going to, uh, very happy to introduce our uh, distinguished panelist. Uh, the first speaker will be Dr. Rose Amari. She is a senior researcher, si research scientist at the Science and Technology Policy Institute, Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in Ghana. Dr. Omari is, uh, coordinated the development of Ghana's national policy and technical regulation for aflatoxin control in food and feed, and is an experienced researcher in policy, monitoring and evaluation, stakeholder engagement, and advocacy. Mr. Kwame Botang is the founder and CEO of Sahel Grains Limited, based in Ghana. The Hell Grains uh, is a vertically integrated value chain provider with upstream operations in farm mechanization and downstream primary and secondary processing. The Hell Grains focus on quality has made it the primary supplier of maize to Nestle Ghana. Mr. Francois and Sengu, pardon me, Francois. <laughs> uh, and Sangim Yumba is the uh, CEO of Kalimo uh, General Business Limited, which is a professional seed company. He is also a chairperson of the Chamber of Agriculture and Livestock in Rwanda. He is an agricultural um, and agribusiness expert and has previously worked for the Ministry of Agriculture and Animal Resources in Rwanda. Mr. Jean-Claude Moyangabo has served as the Chief Executive Officer for BT Tech House in Rwanda since 2018. 
He has 15 years experience in business development and different uh, telecommunication and technology companies. And finally, we'll have Mr. Patrice Akizimana, uh, currently serving um, as the Agriculture and Rural Development Specialist in USAID Rwanda. Prior to working for USAID, he worked for the government of Rwanda as a scientist on rice and sorghum crops, and he also served as a director for the Rwanda um, Agriculture Development uh, Authority. At this point, I'd like to open it up to Dr. Agnes Kalabata to provide her opening remarks. So thank you so much for organizing uh, this event. Let me start by thanking USAID for organizing this event and uh, recognizing that uh, one of the, of the biggest challenges of our time still remains uh, the, the basic idea of agricultural transformation, at least here on the African continent. And that remains a challenge because at least seven in every 10 Africans live in agriculture and being able to transform this sector is something that we work with every day and something that um, should be a worry to many of us that work on the continent. Mostly because it's not really just about ending hunger, it's also the opportunity that, that is available to most people to get themselves out of poverty. So I really appreciate uh, USAID working with uh, AGRA and other partners to advance this agenda and to prioritize this agenda. But I want to start by recognizing the work we just did in the Food Systems Summit and putting on my Food Systems hat and just recognizing the contribution there uh, the USAID made to ensure that African governments participate in dialogues. We made the Food Systems Summit about dialogues so that countries can engage. We pr presented an opportunities so that countries can engage so they have a, a chance to look at food from a systems perspective, not from an end hunger perspective, but to also recognize that food impacts uh, our environment, it impacts our health, it is so many things to so many people, and not being able to address it from a food systems perspective is a missed opportunity for many of us. But let me also recognize now that I'm talking about the continental perspective, uh, the food system perspective and continental perspective, let me also recognize the leadership that the U.S. government has provided through USAID until now in getting a lot of work off the ground with CADAP, remembering very well that CADAP was launched here in Rwanda for the first time. And we had a whole lot of support from the U.S. government to kick it off. That leadership is always needed. The leadership to get things moving, which is what we needed, but also the leadership to mobilize other, other leaders. In addition to that, I want to recognize two other efforts that came on the heels of CADAP. The effort around Grow Africa that recognized that uh, private partnerships are very critical to, ad to advancing agricultural transformation. And then the efforts around Africa Lead that recognized that moving policies and the policy environment are very critical to advancing um, agricultural transformation. Fast forward, we have been working with USAID uh, in, on a number of areas that recognize three things. That recognize that agricultural transformation is really about supporting governments to deliver on their mandate and supporting institutions, ensuring that they are institutions that can deliver uh, on the, the, the idea of an agricultural transformation, that are built and have the ability to advance agricultural transformation. The second is the, it, it, this relationship is built on recognizing the role of private sector and the fact that private sector functions where policies are in place that can help advance the private sector perspective and move things forward. And then the third one on the fact that recognizing that advancing food systems and, and agricultural transformation in Africa is going to require technologies and really anchoring this work on the ability of farmers and farming communities to access technologies that can transform their yields and can transform their, their lives. This is something that has been happening on, in other continents for quite some time. So when USA, the US government through USAID uh, joined forces with AGRA recognizing that helping farmers access improved seeds uh, good ways of using fertilizers uh, is really recognizing 
the centrality of, of um, anchoring some of these elements in agricultural transformation. So we've, we've really worked with the US uh, in, in terms of, if I go through each of these areas, um, we've worked with USAID in a number of areas in capacity building for different institutions, contributing to the whole work we are doing um, uh, in, in uh, institutions that uh, have helped advance a number of scientists that are now breeding some of the best varieties some of these countries are seeing. We have worked together in developing private sector capacity in across a number of countries on the continent. Some of these countries now are seeing a major transformation because they have functional systems around input systems for farmers. This was done uh, through the, the work that we did in the first 10 years of AGRA. And now the work we are doing together, recognizing that um, no, no one from outside really can transform a country. At the end of the day, we have to work and strengthen the capacities of these countries to do their own work. And this started with Africa Lead, and Agra is building on, on, on this as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Agra is building on the back of this to really uh, ensure a few things happen in terms of trans moving the agricultural sector forward. And our partnership is also built around that. Uh, first of all, that we work with the governments to ensure that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the things we've agreed on from a, a Paris and Canada perspective, the things we've agreed on around coordination are happening and moving uh, uh, government capacity and country capacity forward is happening. I'm extremely grateful that USAID sees the opportunity but also believes in Agra's uh, ability to be able to move this work forward. And we've done quite some work in a number of countries in, uh, through the work we are doing in flagships, where uh, we are supporting governments to develop uh, flagship programs that, they, that can help ad advance the agricultural uh, sector in those countries forward, starting from ideation uh, of, of um, some of the strategies or building on some of the strategies that already exist uh, and ensuring that flagship programs are designed that speak to national perspective, but also ensure the right level of engagement from government uh, from the start of the program to implementation of the program. So some of these are happening across different countries. And then the work we are doing in developing systems that will ensure that private sector can deliver, whether it is from seed systems, where we've done a, a whole lot of work uh, all the way from ensuring that there's capacity for breeding, uh, building on local varieties and local context, to capacity for business, building on local companies and strengthening the abilities of these companies, to capacities for markets to function, and, and the, which, which really then translates into the work we are doing around the policy environment. And there are quite a number of examples across a number of countries we are working in, and you'll be hearing some of these, but some of which you won't hear about for example, is the work that we are doing in Burkina Faso on advancing the rice sector, the work we've done in Ghana advancing the rice sector, or the work that we've done in Ethiopia uh, to, in, in advancing a mechanization through removal of, of taxes, um, where government provide, then recognizes the value of the agricultural sector and removes taxes to ensure that farmers can access access um, equipment uh, to move on the agricultural, the agricultural sector forward, or the work that we are doing with value for her. Some of these pieces we've already submitted to you in, in um, the different pieces uh, that, uh, that, uh, that highlight uh, the work we are doing in, 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 in Agra. But let me just call out that some of the work that we are most proud of uh, that we've done with you all, probably nothing beats the seed systems, not, not because uh, I, I love research or, or, or what, but because it is the anchor, it recognizes the anchor. It is an anchor to agricultural transformation. It is something that speaks to what farmers do and what farmers do well. Farmers appreciate good seed. Uh, what they don't have is the technological part of, of a good seed. But every African farmer at the beginning of every season spends time to find a good seed. So when that good is an improved variety that gives them the ability to be able to have more yield and improve their lives, that goes a very long way. So that there's been a lot of work working with, with USAID on, on that part. And in the countries where we are working, at least yields, you can now talk about yields of an average of about two tons per hectare, from about 0 0.5 tons per hectare. Now, two tons per hectare is not where we should be. What, the reason most of these countries are stuck at two tons per hectare 
speaks to other parts of an agricultural transformation that we should be addressing as well. It speaks to the quality of markets they have. It speaks to the ability of trade and the trade environment that they are working with. It speaks to probably soil issues that we are not able to crack. So a farmer that produces two metric tons and gets stuck on, from a market perspective is not going to try to do more from a technology perspective. So I, I do want to recognize that uh, a technology transformation from an agricultural transformation perspective is a journey. We've cracked the first few pieces of the journey that actually will, will be able to lead to food security. At about two metric tons per hectare, you probably are securing food for most families. But to sustain it, will need us to go beyond that. To sustain us, will to sustain that, will need us to figure out the the question of sustainability itself that comes from functional institution, the question of markets and trade environment that wants makes a farmer wants to go more to, to do more, that ma makes a business wants to want to be in a new area, and that allows technologies to be advanced and 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 adopted at at higher levels than they are currently being adopted. So these are challenges that we must continue to work through. And, but at, uh, I just wanted to really appreciate and recognize that uh, through the initial efforts that we've done, uh, through the CADAP work that I talked about, we see a few more countries investing in agriculture more than they done before. Uh, through the work that has happened with Grow Africa, we see a few investments that happened on the continent, not as many as would have wanted, but quite some have happened enough to prove the point that we were trying to make. And again, from a, and a transformational journey, there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot more we can do. And uh, the opportunity that sits in our midst is now what we can do together from a food trust, a food uh, food systems perspective that allows some of the resources that are being spent on dealing with some of the challenges of our food system, like climate change. To, to, to be brought forward, uh, to be brought into a food systems approach to, to really prevent, ensure first of all, resilience of systems, adaptation of, for smallholder farmers to, to climate change, because that's something we have to, to, to address, but also ensure that we are sustaining some of the things we've already put in place. So I, 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 will, I want to stop here, but really want to, to thank uh, our partnership wants to thank the US government's continued support and want to call on you all for leadership. Leadership is extremely important. We have, like I gave you the example, we had, uh, we, ha we have had this, some of these frameworks in place for some time and sometimes we have them for some time. It just needs a little bit of leadership and the energy to move them forward. And uh, the African government has provided its own leadership. I mean, the African, some of the African governments have provided their own leadership. There are many places to look for leadership in Africa that we can learn from, but we also appreciate the partnership and the leadership that comes from USAID uh, in moving some of these things forward. So I'll stop there and I look forward to hearing from the teams that uh, are presenting the different case studies that have come from the work we've done together. But really appreciate the leadership uh, that the US government has provided and the partners that we work together under the, Piata, under the Piata partnership and so many other partners that are engaging in different places to work with us all to deliver on this journey of agricultural transformation. There's not going to be one partner that will be able to deliver this, but through a, a combined partnership um, of all of us, recognizing some of these areas that I talked about, we definitely will be able to move this forward. Thank you again. All right, thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this meeting. So I represent the uh, Science and Technology Policy Research Institute, which is a public research institute in Ghana. Next slide, please. So my presentation will focus on the importance of aflatoxin control and then the policy that we've been working on, I'll talk about the rationale, the goal of the policy, the strategic objectives and the achievements we have made so far and our sustainability plans. Next. Next slide. Aflatoxins, as I think we may all know now, are toxins that are produced by some species of molds or fungi 
that grow on food crops. So we can have them growing on grains. And as they grow, they produce these toxins that we call aflatoxins. So we can find the toxins in grains and their processed products. So humans, livestock, and fish get exposed to aflatoxins by eating contaminated food or feed. And also we can get exposed through occupations. Once a farmer is handling contaminated grains, you can get exposed through inhalation. We can also get exposed through uh, uh, transmission from mother to child, through the breast milk or through the placenta. Now, aflatoxins are dangerous because they have health effects. And it's been known that they cause liver diseases and liver cancer. They also suppress the immune system and they can cause stunting. And then they are also associated with delay in recovery from protein energy malnutrition, which you normally call cause your call. They can also cause reduction in micronutrient status because they are able to bind with some micronutrients in the body such as vitamin A and zinc, so they are unavailable for the body to use. And in, in severe cases, it can lead to death. They also cause economic and uh, food security effects. For example, you can have loss of revenue due to product rejections from buyers. If buyers are not buying, we are, we are, we, you can lose. You can have food industries, exporters, aggregators, refusing to buy because the products are contaminated. And we can also have loss of food because when the grains are badly contaminated, we have to dispose of them and that is a food loss. We can also have uh, death from livestock, fish, all these, you can have low productivity from uh, poultry, for example, they lay fewer eggs. So because of all these things, uh, they need for us to really control the aflatoxin. And when we talk about the, the cost due to the disease burden, it can be very high and there could be loss of productivity as a result. Next slide, please. So there have been a number of activities in Ghana and elsewhere to control aflatoxin so that farmers can, can, can have a increased revenue and all of us can also have good health. But we realize that in Ghana, most of these activities are fragmented and poorly coordinated. As a result, the impacts are very minimal. And also there's inefficient utilization of resources. So we thought that having a national policy in place will enable us to harness the collective skills and strengths of various institutions and stakeholders for efficient management of aflatoxins. So we approach AGRA to, 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 to fund these projects and they accepted to fund the development of the national policy. And the national policy is, is expected to spell out the key issues, the what needs to be done as a country and what every stakeholder will have to do, the resources that are required as well as even the funding sources that we can tap into. And the policy is also uh, expected to align with the ECOWAS Aflatoxin Control Action Plan, which was adopted in 2015 by Ministers of Agriculture, and also it will align with the uh, strategy of the Partnership for Aflatoxin Control in Africa. Then in addition to this, we also felt a technical regulation was required to provide guidelines for regulators to be able to enforce standards and legis legislations on aflatoxins. Next slide. Next slide, please. Next. So we have made some achievements. Uh, the technical regulation has been enacted in, uh, by Parliament in December 2020. We have had four ministries that have endorsed the draft policy and have agreed to own the policy and lead in its implementation. Ministry of Food and Agriculture, Ministry of Trade and Industry, Ministry of Health, and Ministry of Environment, Science, Technology, and Innovation. The draft policy is currently going through the cabinet's approval process. 
And uh, I can say that we have also done a number of sensitization activities with several stakeholders. So for now, there is heightened awareness and interest by stakeholders in aflatoxins. We have media interest. Several stakeholders are contacting us for collaborations. Next slide. Next. In terms of sustainability, because we, we don't want this uh, policy to, to remain unimplemented, we have put some measures in place. The policy itself has an implementation plan, a five-year implementation plan, specifying the key activities, the role of every stakeholder, the budget needed, and also the funding sources. We have developed a resource mobilization plan as well as an ME plan so that, so that we can track the implementation of the policy. We have also inaugurated a national steering committee for aflatoxin control. And this committee is expected to, to ensure that we have sustained interest in aflatoxins as well as uh, uh, helping in mobilizing resources for implementing the implementation plan. We have also, we have decided that we need to develop a lot of project proposals. As a result of that, we have already secured funding from Standard and Trade Development Facility to help us prioritize the activities in the action plan and also develop some project proposals for funding. We have done a lot of sensitization and collated project ideas from stakeholders. So as a key lesson from all this process, I can say that policy development is complex. It requires a lot of resources, adequate time, and patience of all the stakeholders and funders. Next slide. Yeah, before I say thank you, I would just like to show you some of the photographs we took showing the high level consultations we did with the four key ministries food and agriculture, trade and industry, uh, food and agriculture, and then environment and technology. And you could see that the COVID pandemic actually had an effect on our activity. So you can see that we are all uh, we are observing the COVID uh, protocols. So on this note, I would like to thank you very much for this opportunity. So I will now hand over to Mr. Kwame Boatin. Uh, my name is Kwame Boateng, um, and I'll be talking about a case study about a flastoxin safe maize in Ghana. Uh, I think earlier on we heard from Dr. Uh, Rosamari, and she gave us a broader uh, national perspective on aflatoxin, uh, you know, the regulatory side, the national policy side. Uh, I'll be talking about our case study from the bottom up, uh, what businesses and what farmers are doing to be able to meet that standard. Um, so, uh, Sahel Grains, we, uh, uh, can we move to the next slide, please? So, uh, Sahel Grains, we started in 2010, um, you know, uh, and uh, we're based in Techiman. We made a business decision that we're going to differentiate ourselves in the marketplace by focusing on premium quality maize. Um, you know, we do about 2 million metric tons of maize a year in Ghana. And we have a very, very crowded marketplace. So we said, look, uh, our, our focus, our area of differentiation is going to be maize that is only like the highest grade human food quality maize. So we made that decision. Uh, and the result of that decision is that now we are one of the largest suppliers of uh, maize to uh, Nestle for their infant uh, cereal uh, product, uh, Cerelac. Uh, we also have been able to be able to export maize to uh, Europe. Uh, and then we had uh, the uh, FDA and the uh, Ghana Standards Authority uh, 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 approve uh, some of our products, and they are widely available, you know, uh, in, in many of the leading supermarkets in Ghana. Right. So, uh, you know, we have facilities. Uh, uh, I mean, we have products. We have some customers that we've shown. But if you want to think about it, uh, where Sahel Grain sits, we sit right in the nexus of the farmer, uh, other businesses, and then uh, consumers, right? And we want to make sure that we have a very uh, like thorough view. So we have a 360 degree view. Uh, Nestle is mostly looking at, you know, uh, I mean, Cerelac is uh, more affluent type product, but then we also have traditional products that we want to make sure that, you know, uh, I mean, that traditional food consumers are also able to participate uh, in the aflatoxin safe products that we have, right? So, uh, you know, uh, in, our, in our traditional local food, we have uh, Mori. So we have uh, the first, 
uh, of its kind, FDA approved Mori, uh, and then the GSA also approved Mori, uh, that you can go and buy for traditional local foods. So, you know, um, I mean, consumers who want uh, Nestle can also get that, but then people who also prefer local uh, traditional foods can also be able to get that, right? Now, um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, the structure of the work that we're doing now is, is most like a tripartite type of work. Uh, it is our Sahel Grace as the implementing partner. We work with Nestle. Nestle creates the demand sink. Uh, you know, they have over 100 years of experience with quality, with infant nutrition, uh, with, you know, the highest uh, food safety standards. So they provide the framework, the standards for us, I mean, for all of us to meet. And then, you know, we also have the very important part of the farmers making sure that we can work with them, we can train them to be able to make sure they can meet this standard. Uh, and then our focus is, I mean, has been on uh, mostly the youth farmers, uh, because if you look at uh, Ghana, for example, our uh, median age for the country is around, you know, low 20s. Uh, the median age for the farmer is, you know, uh, uh, early 50. So there's a misbalance there. And we focus, I mean, we decided we're going to focus on the youth farmers so we can have a much broader, stronger pipeline going forward, right? So, uh, you know, it is the youth entrepreneurs and, you know, the, uh, the, the term for the entrepreneurs is just to make sure they have a business and like a farming as a, as a business mindset, right? They can have, you know, higher yield, higher incomes, and then they can be able to be able to mechanize, grow their businesses. Uh, uh, so, you know, we have the youth, uh, youth entrepreneurs, we have Sahel Grants, and we have Nestle, and that provides the structure uh, for, I mean, for the um, uh, agro partnership that we have now. Next slide, please. So uh, what, you know, if aflatoxin uh, safety is our focus, and actually I'll broaden that to mycotoxin safety, uh, because there are other, you know, toxins be besides aflatoxin, and uh, Nestle has a much broader set of standards beyond aflatoxin, but, you know, because aflatoxin is just, uh, you know, probably the most important of all these uh, uh, toxins, uh, that is what gains more not uh, notoriety. Uh, but uh, just to set the framework here, uh, uh, the national standard for aflatoxin is about 15 parts per billion. It's a very rigid, uh, I mean, very strict standard. But Nestle, uh, just to give you perspective, is, you know, um, about three parts per billion, right? So it's about 80% more strict than what the national Ghana standard is. Uh, and why is it three parts per billion? Because, you know, Nestle is a global uh, enterprise uh, based in Switzerland. So, you know, they're not going to set one standard in Europe and then come and, you know, set a uh, more of a relaxed standard uh, here in Ghana. Uh, I, I don't think that would probably be good policy. So they want to set one global standard. So um, what they've done is that, look, Ghana standard is 15 parts per billion. They can do 15 parts per billion and sell locally, and they'll you know, be within the law. But they said, look, we're going to push three parts per billion. So that is the standard that we have to meet. We have to meet that with our farmers. Uh, and that is what we've been meeting consistently for the past three, four years. Uh, to the point where that we are now endorsed by the Pediatric Society of Ghana because of the high quality of the maize that we produce. Uh, we've been able to export it to Europe. Uh, we've been certified by the FDA and, and the GSA. So this gives you a sense of some of the achievements that we've been able to chalk up uh, working with Agra, working with our fathers. Uh, and then uh, we can be able to tell you, uh, next slide, uh, show you how we, um, like our approach towards uh, making sure that we, I mean, uh, uh, I mean to hit this results, right? So uh, the, if there's one word to describe the approach, it is, you know, uh, like a comprehensive value chain approach. Uh, we have factories, we have, you know, uh, all the modern equipment, but you cannot stay in your factory and, you know, all of a sudden you get the maize, right? And you cannot just show up at the beginning uh, of the harvest period and just tell the farmers, you know, I want to buy this quality maize. So we start our engagement even before they start plowing the field, right? So we start our engagement very early on. Uh, and, you know, if you want to build a very sustainable, long-term approach to a uh, relationship with farmers, you really have to be able to meet them where they really uh, are, right? So uh, we have, we are one of the largest mechanized services providers to farmers uh, uh, in Ghana. We have tractors, we have planters, um, you know, we have treasures and so on. So we work with our farmers hands-on uh, to make sure that, you know, we are really committed to their work. And then, you know, we are, uh, I mean, we are in for the long haul. So when we work with them, we also train them, you know, working in conjunction with the uh, local extension service of the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, working in, uh, in conjunction with Nestle. Uh, we train them so that there are no surprises. They understand exactly what we need. Uh, and then, you know, they know the standards. And then, you know, uh, we buy. We, you know, we make sure that we provide substantial market access to uh, 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 the, um, the products that they uh, produce. 
But even uh, with all that training, you know that, uh, you know, uh, you're not going to get a perfect harvest, right? Everything coming from the field is not going to be 100% safe. So we have primary processing that we do. Uh, we take our maize through. The first step is that we have to test. You have to measure the outcome of the work that we've done with the farmers. So we have a very good lab, you know, I mean, uh, on site. We take every input from our field through the test. You know, we test for, my, you know, uh, we test for uh, feminisms, we test for aflatoxins. Uh, you know, we do a moisture test, but, you know, given our zone of influence, the area that we work, my, uh, my moisture tests are not that, you know, I mean, significant. But we test them, and then the farmers, we give feedback to the farmers. They, they, they know exactly what uh, they are producing. Uh, we make sure that the relationship is tied to outcome. We provide premium pricing. So we do the primary processing, and then that is the output of the primary processing is what goes to Nestle. They take it and they take it through their whole suite. Now, just to give you a sense, we test, Nestle also tests. They send samples to Singapore uh, for, I mean, for more advanced testing. Uh, just because, you know, we're talking about infant nutrition. We're talking about potential exports from the Ghana factory uh, to Europe, to other places. So this is, I mean, this is a big deal for uh, Nestle, and it's a big deal for us. So uh, the testing is very, very substantial. Uh, for the past two years, there's not been a single return of a batch that we sent to Nestle. Everything's checked out. So uh, from the primary process in Nestle, becomes a customer. Sometimes we export some to Europe. Now the second level processing is, we, say, uh, we call that secondary processing, and it is that that goes to our traditional foods. So right now, you know, Ghana, uh, the second largest city is in Kumasi. We are heavily in Kumasi. If you go to Kumasi, you want to buy Kenke, you want to buy Banku, it's very likely that you'll be buying product from our farmers, we're doing about 20,000 metric tons of products um, a, a week. Uh, that's enough to feed about 100,000 people. Uh, uh, that's enough for 100,000 meals a week, right? So that is the level that we are. By the end of this year, we'll be quintupling that to about 100,000, uh, so close to about half a million meals a week, right? So that is where we are. Uh, and, and, you know, I think that the top level view from uh, 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 that uh, Dr. Rusomari talked about uh, that the national policies try to advocate, I think that will probably set more of a standard for us that we can be able to more, create more of a demand, right? Because right now we have to do more talking, more convincing, and I think I'll probably talk about that towards the end of the, uh, of the, of the, uh, of the discussion. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just more of, uh, uh, you know, just, uh, just to digest what I've probably talked about uh, now, that, uh, you know, uh, to make this thing work, you need more of an uncle, uncle partner, right? And Nestle has been a fantastic, awesome uncle partner. Uh, what they've done is that they've trained all of us, including us, our health grains, to set a, I mean, to set a standard, right? And from that, I mean, one of the outgrowth of that standard is, yes, look, we're not going to let what we've learned with Nestle stay with Nestle. How are we going to apply that to our traditional foods? Because we've been consuming that thing for hundreds and hundreds of years. And what we just want to apply to, we want to apply some advanced lessons that we've Pick from Nestle, one of, uh, you know, uh, taking some of the uh, like modern methods and apply it to it. So I think that we are in Kumasi now. Our goal is to expand rapidly to the rest of the country to make sure that the, you know, the, you know, all the uh, ill health effects that Dr. Marie talked about, we are, uh, you know, be able to address that from a national, commercial, economic uh, perspective. And I think uh, the other thing is that, you know, if you have a, a very important uncle partner like Nestle it gives you the basis to be able to also export, right? You know, so every container we've sent overseas, we haven't had a single problem with it uh, because frankly, the Nestle standard is actually even more stringent, more strict than the European standards that they apply, right? So just, just so, you know, just to summarize, uh, you know, we've done important work with the uh, Agro Nestle uh, and then our youth farmers. And I think it's provided a very, very good uh, 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 framework that we can be able to use to, uh, tackle the national policy that Dr. Mari talked about, and also be able to make sure that uh, as we grow yield, because right now, if you look at it, you know, we are about grain, you know, um, I mean, when it comes to maize, we are about demand parity, right? Uh, and as yield grows, uh, we're going to get to a point where we have to find a market for the, uh, I mean, for the excess uh, yield that we're going to have. And it has to go to Europe. It has to go to other places, right? Uh, and I think that uh, for it to be able to meet those standards, we have to make sure that uh, ag agriculture serves its highest potential uh, that's health and then also be able to generate uh, very, very hard currency exports for us. The standards, you know, making sure that uh, the business is able to be able to meet the standards, the farmers are able to meet the high quality standards is actually very, very important and very core cool for the growth of it. Right. So uh, I think uh, that that's it for me. And then I'm going to introduce the next speaker, Mr. Francois.
Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for giving me this great opportunity to share with you what has been the journey of Rwanda in seed industry development. The journey started in 2007. Go to the next slide, please. When the government of Rwanda introduced the program of crop intensification just to address the issue of food uh, shortage that was prevailing in that time. And uh, by that time, more than 60% of the food consumed locally was imported from neighbor countries. So by 2007, the government of Rwanda decided to just to jump for the next step and do something for agriculture transformation. And by that time, as I want to talk about seed industry, all seeds utilized by small scale farmers were 100% imported from neighbor countries. You go to the next slide, please. And many of them, the seeds was about maize, Bean, uh, soya bean, wheat, all of those seeds were imported from, especially from Kenya, Zambia, and Tanzania. And by putting in place the crop intensification program, the government of Rwanda was obliged to do some subsidy because they, to get farmers familiar with using improved seeds, it was not easy. So the government was obliged to put the subsidy and it, it, it started by putting 100% of subsidy on imported and improved seed. For, from 2007 to up to 2019, I say I, I, all seeds uh, uh, utilized here in Rwanda were imported and by 2016, the government of Rwanda decided to set up a policy that should make Rwanda more self-resilient about seed production. And the, the policy was set and the, the, to be able to promote the production processing and the marketing, marketing of the locally produced seed by that time. And to be able to involve the private sector by that time, the, the policy was saying that that sector, the city industry in Rwanda, will be private led. And to be able to, to secure the private sector coming in that, in, in that industry, the government published the city law that for guidance and the regulator of the sector. And once the policy and the law were there, Everybody was asking himself, how can we do that? And here, I really take this opportunity to congratulate, congratulate AGRA and its partner because they played a very big role and catalytic role to bring together private sector and government institution to work closely together to implement this policy. And I'm glad, next slide, please. I'm glad that now the things are happening. Very early, early the 2020, the government of Rwanda signed a memorandum of understanding with private sector to develop this industry and to lead this industry. And the 2021 early, the government of Rwanda privatized the seed plant, which was a very big infrastructure that helps that helps private sector to deliver on high quality seed. This is very very important because through the memorandum of understanding, the, it is clear that government of Rwanda will keep only research, regular, regulation activities, and 
policy activities. That was for government of Rwanda. On the other side, for private sector, the company, private company, were, were, are involved in seed production, processing, and marketing. And I assure you, in the past, 100% of those activities were done by government, from production, importation, processing, and distribution were done by government uh, agencies. So, and I'm proud now to announce that in our country, in Rwanda, we have today more than 30 private companies which are involved in all those value chains, seed production, seed processing, and seed marketing. And for the first time, this year, actually, we are in the first season of the year, all seeds, especially for maize, wheat, and the soya bean, 100%, are locally produced and we are supplying the market, we are supplying small scale farmers. And the most important thing that I have to mention here is that now we did it at the right time. The people, the small scale farmers are not complaining about quality, are not, are not complaining about delays. So the private sector, when they were involved in this process, in this industry, to have already started to deliver to the farm gate the high quality seed at the right time. Based also on the different seeds value chain, as private sector, we said, okay, let us do a better coordination and a better self-regulation. To do that, we have developed what we call seed chapters. And all those seed chapters, they meet into national seed consortium for better planning, for better monitoring and evaluation, and for better regulation. Because as you are new in this seed industry, we need to have a higher level of discipline, a higher level, a higher level of quality respect. So to do that, we need to do ourselves, our self-regulation to be able to deliver on that. Next slide, please. By doing that, we are also facing some challenges. You see in Rwanda, as today, all, uh, all farmers are not yet adopted, uh, have not yet adopted the, to use the improved seeds. We are just at around 30% of farmers are using the improved seed. Also, as emerging seed companies, there is a very big lack of skills in variety, planting material management and maintenance. So there are some planting material which have been developed by research institutions. So they are being given to private company to be developed and produce certified seeds. So we need to maintain the planting material, but how to do it? We need to build the capacity of our staff or the, of our technician to be able to, to learn to do properly our job and maintain this planting material in a, to be able to sustain what we are doing today. Also, 100% of vegetable seeds are still imported. We need also to, to move to vegetable seeds because, as you know, they play a big role in nutrition systems. So if we don't trust locally the vegetable seeds, why not seed resilient country? There is a gap on financial side. On the financial side, there is a lot of gaps because, as you see, the seed industry has a particularity in terms of financial cycle. You, you need to wait for 18 months to be able to get your money back. And when you go to the local financial market, there is no product addressing that issue. So we need to, to come out with a very good adapted financial products and financing mechanism because the classic bank with classic models that cannot help agriculture transformation. So we need to learn the products which are adapted and appropriate for agriculture activities. We have also climate change. 
effects we try not to play in our favor you know that is a very big it's a worldwide challenge also we have had this covid and covid 19 has caused a lot of, a lot of loss for different smes in this country and um here I can, for instance i can say we have conducted a study this year that we are just concluding now and more than six percent of smes now they, they dropped out because they cannot survive the climate business under COVID regulations. Next, please. What is the, our future as a Rwanda private sector in the seed industry to develop? We need really, we are, determ we are determined to increase the adoption rate of the use of improved seeds and go beyond borders, Rwandan borders, and be able to be a hub of high quality seed in the region. We are really committed for that. There is also this permanent public-private dialogue that we need to we will continue, because as you walk every day, you meet new challenges, and it's up to us to come and sit with the government and discuss different issues and adopt new strategy to go ahead, to move ahead. Next, please. Next, we need also to strengthen the structure that we are putting in place as a city chapter and a city consortium to be able to do and to deliver on that because self-organization, better organization we have, will grow very fast and sustain very fast what we are doing. We are just requesting for in-house capacity building so you, as a new companies, we need some breeder to help us to train our people, our technician and our agronomists to be able to have those skills to be able to maintain and develop new planting materials. The financial mechanism is really imperative if we need to develop this industry. We have started with limited means from our own money, from uh, support from Agra and partners, but we need to strengthen what we are doing. And it requires a lot of money that you cannot mobilize easily. So we don't need really aid. What we need is to access affordable finance, to access on-time finance, which will help us to respect the seasonality of agriculture and deliver to small farmers the affordable seeds with high quality. I take this occasion to thank you for giving us this opportunity and to thank especially Agra and its partner who has supported government of Rwanda and the private sector to set up this seed industry, which is growing very fast. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm called Jean-Claude Munyangabo. I'm the CEO of Bika Tech House. I'm going to talk about the digitization of the distribution of the subsidized agro inputs in Rwanda through a digital platform that is called Smart Munganile System. Next, please. Smart Munganile System is a digital platform that has been put in place uh, between the public-private partnership, uh, through the public-private partnership between uh, Rwanda Agriculture Board and the BK Tech House. Next. So this platform is all about the digitization of the agro inputs. By agro inputs, I mean seeds and fertilizers, which are subsidized by the government. So the partnership was concluded back in 2017, and the mandate actually given to BK Tech House through this partnership was first of all to, to digitize the registration and the, the farmer profiling of all farmers. I'm, would I, I'm happy to say that up to now, as, as of now, this digital platform actually is counting around 1,300,000 farmers already uh, 
subscribed to this platform. So the second mandate was to enable digitally the registration and the profiling of all agro dealers here in Rwanda, so which are dealing with the seeds and fertilizers. So as of now, we're counting on our platform across the country, 1,300 agro dealers. Then the next mandate was to digitize and enable the registration of all the seed suppliers and the fertilizer suppliers. And as of now, we are talking in terms of 32 uh, agro input suppliers uh, registered in our platform. Then uh, the next mandate was to digitize uh, the total linkage between, I mean, from the farmers going through the agro dealers up to the suppliers and the Rwanda agriculture board. So how does it happen? So when the farmers actually, when, <clears throat> here in Rwanda there is a agriculture ministry instruction that initiated the startup of the agriculture season. And it is through this ministry of agriculture, agriculture instruction that all the key stakeholders actually are being called, about, called up on to use the, 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 this digital platform. So what happens is that at the start of the agriculture season, all the farmers are mobilized to get registered. And when they are registered, they are required to have three main data points. The first main data points is the, the farmer national identification number. The second data points is the what we call the UPI, that is the unit plot identification. identification. And the third is for the farmer to have the size of the cultivable land. So when the farmer, what happens is that when registering, the farmer enters in the platform the national identification number. And through the integration of this digital platform with the national ID uh, platform, the system pulls up all the farmer profiling information from that integration and you have all the farmer profiling. Secondly, when the farmer puts in the system the UPI number, because this platform is integrated with land management platform, so this platform, this platform manages to have all the plot profiling information coming right away through that integration. And when the farmer puts in the, 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 the UPI, so the system recognizes the, the location and the GP has the GPS coordinates of the plot. And from there, the system recognizes the recommended crop by rub that the farmer will be planting from there. Then as next, the system requ requests the farmer to put in, in the system the cultivable size of the land. So when the farmer puts in the system the cultivable size of the land, the system intelligently calculates the required quantity for the fertilizer of fertilizers and the seeds for that size of the land. So then from that registration, the system has all the upfront market information, which is go, which are going, which are shared to the agro, to the agro dealers, which are shared to the suppliers, and which are shared to the government. So, meaning that after the farmer registration, from the village level, going through the district up to the national level, so all the key stakeholders in this subsidy program, they have the upfront information about the size of the market. By size of the market, I mean the number of the farmers who will be purchasing inputs in that season. And they know they require the stock at the national level, at the district level, at the agro dealer level, even at the village level, which are, which, are, which are going to be purchased for the inputs, the planting season. So meaning that this is, uh, this is kind of uh, a, a, a planning tool with all the required information in terms of the, 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 the input demand that is required upfront before the start of the season. Uh, in this figure, we are seeing the dark blue. 
this is those are the futures which are already in place. In the way you're seeing the orange, those are the futures which are not yet in place. Futures which are not yet in place include the advisory services. They include the financial services. By financial services, I mean the micro loan, the pharma micro loan, and even the agro dealer stock loan. And it includes as well the post harvest market linkage. So uh, towards the end of last year, it was, uh, towards the end of December uh, 2020, so BK Tech House actually got to be funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to develop those missing, missing futures. Next, please. So the expected goal through this funding from Gates Foundation is that the farmer will be increasing the productivity then the system may be enabling the financial inclusion, and the system may be capable to onboard uh, additional digitization for other crops. So then from there, next please. Then from there, the funding targets to enable more access to agro inputs to enable financial and digital literacy, to enable access to affordable credit insurance and payments, to enable access to structured and stable market, to enable the digitization of a crop value chain, to improve the digital farmer profile, to enable the digital financial inclusion, and to enable more connected SNS ecosystem, and to enable the digital based practices. So this gap actually is expected to, I mean, to, to be implemented the, in the next couple, couple of years, going through from 2021 up to 2023. That's when you believe that the vision, the SNS will have implemented the full vision as per the mandate that we are having uh, with the, the Rwandan government through Rwanda Agriculture Board. So on this note, I thank you for this opportunity, and I'm handing over to the next speaker, that is uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Patrick. Thank you. Thank you, Claude. I'm Patrice Hakizimana. I work for USAID Rwanda Mission, and I will present the mission perspective to agriculture transformation with the emphasis on strategy and actions put in place to help agriculture in the country. Next, next slide, please. USAID Rwanda mission strategic goal is to build the capacity of a human capital, public institution, and private sector involved in social and economic sectors to deliver on Rwanda development agenda. The mission supports the transformation of agriculture sector under the development objective number three of the CDCS known as PROSPER. Next, please. To address different outcomes under PROSPER pillar, projects are developed and implemented by USAID partners to assist the government in the development of policies and regulations that facilitate private investment in agriculture. They support use of productivity enhancing and climate smart technologies and facilitate crop diversification and export of high value crops. They also help improve access to finance and markets and promote women and youth economic empowerment. Next slide, please. One of the ways to foster agriculture modernization and transformation is to strengthen national seed systems. That's the reason why the mission funded the seed project along with other donors 
which supports partnering for inclusive agriculture transformation in Africa, PIATAG program implemented by AGRA. Next, please. The, the project builds the capacity of local research institutions, regulatory bodies, and seed companies to produce more quality seeds to meet farmers' growing demand. It also supports policy and regulation reforms aiming to build a commercially viable seed industry and assists efforts to strengthen seed market systems. Next, please. So far, the project facilitated the public-private dialogues between private sector and Minister of Agriculture to discuss policy issues hampering the development of the seed subsector and come up with collaboration agreements to improve seed businesses, including government leaving seed marketing and distribution operations to seed company and agro dealers, and then taking facilitation and deregulation roles. The project is also upgrading national seed laboratories to meet international seed trade standards. Also, substantial support to local production of hybrid maize seed enabled the country to meet farmers' demand. As a result of all these partnership efforts, the use of improved seed has increased from 24% 20, of farmers using improved seed in 2017 to 35% in 2020. The project also plans to increase efficiency of seed registration, certification, distribution, and marketing services by supporting the use of digital technologies. That's all from me and thank you for your attention and I would be happy to take your question. Over to you, Carol. Great, thank you so much. Um, I think everyone is aware that there's been a lot of questions uh, coming through the system. Um, what we'll be doing is uh, prioritizing by uh, likes, those and those that have not yet been answered. Um, I would encourage our uh, presenters to, uh, to respond to questions directly to them if possible in the uh, Q&A section. And also I want to let people know that uh, Mr. Kwame Botang uh, is not able to stay for the Q&A portion, so we will not be uh, looking at his question. Um, the first one I'd like to um, look at is... Um, Pardon me. Uh, this is to Dr. Kalabata, but this is actually to the broader presenters. Um, if you're only able to address one item in agriculture value chain that you're trying to improve, uh, whether it's food or nutrition security, whether it's policy gap, good agriculture practices, processing um, food waste, irrigation inputs, et cetera, uh, what would you say is the most urgent and most important? And um, Dr. Kalabata, if we could start with you, but I think the other presenters, I would really like to hear your thoughts on that as well. So you're trying, you're asking me uh, the, the one most important challenge. If I was to address only one challenge, what would I go for? Um, that's a tough one because there are quite a number of challenges and they're all important. But really, if I was to address, if I had little money and I had to address only one challenge, I would probably look at the one that um, addresses the ability of institutions to deliver. Um, because I believe in strengthening the capacities of institutions to, to deliver, you equipping them to look at some of the challenges that uh, you would want to address. Number one, you're equipping them to have the ability to mobilize resources for those challenges, and you're equipping them 
to build sustainable systems. So if I had very little money and nothing else to do, I would work on strengthening the, cap the capability of institutions. I'd like to invite one of the other panelists to provide their priorities. Um, perhaps um, could we go to uh, Jean-Claude? Could you pro provide your input? Uh, how about if I hand over to uh, Francoise? Thank you. I think my priority would be, as a businessman, of course, affordable finance. That would be my priority. And because by getting appropriate finance, not expensive, we will be able to deliver on market the affordable improved seed. Thank you. Great, thank you for that. Um, the next question is uh, around um, Dr. Kalabata again, you emph your emphasis on the role of the private sector. Um, I agree, I assume, however, that you also include the importance of private sector for organic products and not only for pesticides, and that the transformation of agriculture in Africa also has to include organic agriculture. So there's a whole lot of misconception. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, thank you. There's a whole lot of misconception around uh, um, agra and its work and uh, agro pesticides or whatever it's called is one of them. Um, we really, our focus is really to ensure that farmers have access to inputs. And inputs are not necessarily agro-pesticides or fertilizers. Inputs are also good seed. Inputs are also access to a tractor. Inputs is also access to water, depending on where farmers are at. So, so being able to create an environment, an ecosystem that allows farmers to access inputs, which is mostly anchored in capacity of SMEs around the farmers to provide that support is what we focus on as agro, creating an ecosystem that functions for the smallholder farmers so that they have choices. If I want to use good seed, I have access to good seed. If I want to use fertilizers, I have access to. If I want to use organic capacity, I have a, a, a mechanism that allows me to do that. So I, I, I think that people need to recognize that. But to address the question around organic uh, use of organic material versus inorganic Organic material is extremely important for improving quality of soil and improving the ability of soil to use water. So there's no question about its role in strengthening the ability of productive systems. Um, the question is, would organic agriculture be able to, to replace the depletion of African soils? The fact that African soils are depleted of critical elements that we need uh, for plants to grow, but also for people's health. We are made of quite a number of elements. Would that compensate for that? It's, uh, organic matter is extremely important for carbon and nitrogen. I'm not sure that it's, it's able to replace all these other elements that we need. So we need to be very careful in terms of how we use in judicious use of fertilizers and be able to use fertilizers very judiciously. But we also need to recognize the fact that our, our soils are highly depleted because of um, you know overuse in agricultural system that that haven't been able to add additional nutrients. So that's what I would say. I have nothing uh, against organic agriculture. I actually believe it's very critical uh, for for function of soil systems. So it's it's a balance. It's finding the balance for any particular system. Great. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is for uh, Francoise. Uh, seeds in Rwanda, does that include also the possibility of use of their own seeds from season to season? How um, we know now how important it is for the biodiversity uh, to keep the traditional crops alive within the country. Could you provide some thoughts on that? Yeah, probably other people like Patrick and Patrice were will contribute on this. But what I want to say here, 
the system that we are facing today, the government of Rwanda has invested more money in the basic infrastructure. Also, also in research. So as business people, as business community, we capitalize on that and we jump in. Jumping in, we, we were able to, to trade. And when we are talking about seeds, we, 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 we were able to produce, to process, and sell. And that business is viable for us, and that is why we are still there. So about biodiversity, that's a scientific issue. I leave it to Mr. Patrick, and Patrice should address it. Thank you. Sorry, what was the question again? Sorry, Carol, uh, I didn't hear well the question. Sorry, I've jumped around to the next question. It was related to the, um, uh, it was, sorry, <laughs> I've lost the question now. Um, that's okay. Let's go to yeah, the next. Let's go to this next one, which also relates to seed producers. And I think this will also provide you, uh, Patrice, with a, an opportunity to respond. How are the Rwanda private maize producers compared um, uh, companies able to compete with Zambia, Kenya, Ugandan players? Um, are they licensing from seed companies in their countries? Has Rwanda put in place any new tariffs? on maize or seed imports, and are maize seed buyers actual farmers or uh, government of Rwanda project oriented? And then this we may also want to um, go back to uh, Francois as well. Yeah, right. So about competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis those big and traditional seed company that you have in the region, especially from Zambia and Kenya, that is possible. As emerging city company in Rwanda, we have a model, a model which links us to smallholder farmers, not only for sale, but only also for seed production by using them as outgrower. So our our clients who are small scale farmers, they know already our seed from production and to use them. And uh, to produce food, it is very easy. The second, well, we need to also to see our strategic and the geographical position. Well, we, can, we can compete with them because the big market is here in Rwanda and you go to DRC and the northern and west Uganda. So we are geographically well positioned to be able to compete with them because, in terms of cost, also in terms of access to market that are the factors that will help us and we count on that to be able to be competitive on market so they have very good experience from that experience we are planning and we have already started to 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 do what we call alliance, strategic alliances with them because they have planting material they have developed they have different technologies so we need to, we are patterning with them just to grow as fast as possible and not come as competitors, but to complement each other. I, that, that is what I can say here. Thank you. Patrice, did you no. have other comments related to the competitiveness of the regional market on seed? Yeah, what I can add to that is that uh, yeah, uh, there are still some uh, skills gap in the local seed companies, and uh, that's why the project uh, with Agra has been uh, in place. So we were interested in building their capacity and skills, but also make sure that really uh, the regulatory framework is working really professionally and it has required skills, but also operation in place to ensure the quality so they can compete with regional markets. But 
uh, I think in terms of markets, uh, markets still large. Uh, in Rwanda, there is still a huge gap in terms of using improved seeds. Mainly those seeds uh, uh, are lacking why the demand among farmers is there. So, but also outside Rwanda, I think also there's still a larger market that Rwanda can contribute, but it needs, uh, first of all, to improve the, the standards uh, the, of the, the, the regulatory bodies, but also the uh, seed producer skills, but also invest in a seed processing infrastructure. But also, I think, also partnership. I think having regional seed companies investing in Rwanda and collaborate with the local seed companies, uh, this is really very important also to improve Rwandan seed sector competitiveness. Uh, but of course, there are required policy and regulations that are conducive to foreign investment in the country that also project, the project is working on. Over to you, Carol. Great, thank you. Um, I believe this is going to be the last um, question, and it's really related. This will be something for each of the presenters. It would be wonderful if you could each comment. It's about the balance. Um, how do you balance the competition for land for food, for feedstock, for various commodities, bioenergy, protected areas, et cetera? Um, how do you integrate food systems into these larger landscapes in the countries where uh, you work? Um, I believe Agnes has stepped off uh, the presentation. Um, and so let's go on to, um, let's go to Rose for her thoughts. No, we have Fadel in online if you, if you oh. want to direct. Fadel, would you like to respond to this um, first? Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Carol. And sorry we joined the call, you know, while it was already underway. I also have my colleague Apollos, uh, who is the Vice President for Policy and State Capability. But I just want to, to highlight the importance of that question, uh, Carol. The really need, the need to strike the right balance between different use of the land. Now, that balancing actually will start from the producer themselves based on their land holding, but also the opportunity they see to access market, to, to, to satisfy their own needs, but also take advantage of existing opportunity, both at the national and, and uh, regional level. And I think that links very much to the question we asked about the seat, the competitiveness of the, you know, around seat uh, production. I think Rwanda, just to stay on this example, is really a good case where you have very high level commitment to build a sector that is quite complex because it requires a balance between public function around research extension, but also private sector function around production, distribution, and commercialization. And you need to strike the right balance through the right regulatory. I don't want to repeat it. But in terms of use of the resources, ultimately the same logic that applies and it has to be incentivized so that farmers are able, based on their production potential, to take advantage of the opportunity. I think in a food system uh, perspective, though, issue around sustainability become prominent. And, and ultimately, what needs to, we need to address is, do we have some policy biases that lead to certain production systems that are not sustainable? And, and this is where the, the partnership between the policy, the farmer, and the downstream support system that Agnes was talking about is extremely important. And, and I think this is really the direction because you have a whole person, the producer is a consumer, he's also the processor. And I think having the right kind of conversation along that ecosystem, this is where we get to that balance. It requires all voices to be heard and for people to cooperate because they see an opportunity to win together. So, so that's my, my, my contribution at the stage, but I, I, you know, I hope it adds to your, to your very rich discussion with the colleagues from Rwanda. But Apollo is also on the call, and maybe he may want to add something. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Apollo, before we hand over to Rose, would you like to provide any comments?
Rose, would you like to provide your thoughts related to those large landscape, uh, those trade-offs uh, related to um, how to balance competition for food, um, land for food, uh, various commodities, bioenergy, uh, protected areas, et cetera? Do you have any thoughts related to that? Yeah, my, my thoughts are brief. I think now we are promoting sustainable intensification programs. I think it's something that we need to really keep on promoting and keep on practicing it. And I think uh, we also have the agroforestry that we are also practicing in Ghana, where you, ha you have food crops being grown in cocoa farms and all that. So I think uh, these two approaches will be helpful. Great, thank you. Uh, Francois, did you have um, comments that you'd like to uh, contribute here? As of now, no, no, you can move ahead. Great, thank you. Jean-Claude? No, Carol, please move ahead. Okay, and Patrice, did you have anything you wanted to add at this point? Yeah, yeah, there were an issue of uh, uh, facilitating uh, regional seed companies uh, investing in Rwanda. I think it's, it's something uh, that uh, USAID is supporting uh, under PIATA program and make sure that uh, there are required uh, policies in the regulation, such as uh, uh, just uh, protection of, of, of plant breeder, breeder rights, but also the process to license uh, uh, planting or planting material or seeds, or uh, just uh, regulation that are needed to be put in place so they can facilitate uh, seed companies and the multinationals who want to invest in the seed industry in Rwanda. We are working on, and this is a strong component of our project for seed system development in the country. Over to you, Cara. Great, thank you, Patrice. Um, thank you to all of the esteemed panelists. Um, this has been an excellent uh, series of presentations. As we can see in the Q&A, we barely scratched the surface. Um, we greatly appreciate your participation and allowing us to go a few minutes <laughs> over time. Um, I think what we're learning from this is this is a very complex situation. And I think that what we're seeing too is there's a clear need for both public sector and private sector engagement. Um, there's a need for uh, engaging small and medium-sized enterprises. We're also looking at that balance between engaging um, agriculture, uh, around increasing agricultural productivity, which, which really does sit at the center of this. How do we do that in a sustainable fashion? How do we do that in a way that um, we have uh, people across um, the population able to participate? So I'm going to close the event. Thank you so much for all the excellent questions. And as you can see, we only scratched the surface here and we hope to see you next time. Thank you very much for your participation.